All right, everybody out there in YouTube land, welcome to tonight's episode of Roleplayer with a Thousand Faces. Um, my name is Matt Yancic, and I'm the founder and I'm the head game master here at Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain. And I'm, I'm pretty excited tonight um, because we have a very special guest on this episode of Roleplayer with a Thousand Faces. Um, so we're, uh, I've tried to dedicate this show to sort of educating and uh, informing and maybe even enlightening you, the role player, uh, about creators and the creative process as well as gaming and storytelling. And tonight we're fortunate enough to have none other than Cody Pondsmith from our Talsorian Games um, with us tonight. So over the years, uh, working with the legendary Maximum Mike Pondsmith, uh, founder of the company, uh, our Talsorian has blessed the role-playing world with no less than four iterations of Cyberpunk. Um, Cyberpunk 2013, uh, Cyberpunk 2020, which is what I found in a small role-playing shop in West Hartford, um, Cyberpunk 3.0, and the latest uh, and, and possibly greatest iteration um, of which tonight's guest was a co-designer, um, Cyberpunk Red, which moves the timeline... Uh, to the year, from what I understand, 2045, uh, during the time of the Red. Um, so, but that's not all, folks. Most other role-playing shows, that'd be that'd be everything that you get. But here at Role Player with a Thousand Faces, we get even more in here. And so, our Talsorian actually, uh, in addition to the Cyberpunk franchise, um, they've been responsible for some other really cool products, like The Witcher uh, tabletop RPG. Um, set in the world of Andre uh, Sapkowski's uh, novel series of the same name that was also made into a Netflix series with Henry Cavill. Um, so, Cody, my goodness, Cody, thank you so much for, for coming on the program tonight. Uh, how, how is it going over there? Oh, it's going pretty well. I'm, I'm real happy to be here. I, oh. I got a I got a quiet moment and I'm I'm over in the office uh, hiding now. <laughs> oh, you are in an off. Okay, so that was something yes. I was wondering about. I I wanted to know like I didn't know if you guys were all working from like home now or if you were in an office or how to. We are we are sort of separated in a way. We we are a very small company in the first place, mm -hmm. um, but uh, me and one of our other uh, designers, um, James Hutt both work in the office we have the benefit of the fact that we have sort of a an office space here and then like a warehouse outside oh wow and uh i work at one side and he works at the other as it right. were and that uh that keeps us relatively well social distance <laughs> that's that's right you're at least six rooms apart yeah in the warehouse yeah. right now okay great well you know cody for those of us who are are unfamiliar with our Talsorian and, and more importantly with Cody Pondsmith. Tell us about Cody. Who who are you and, and what do you do at our Talsorian? Well, really looking deep into the depths of my soul. <laughs> yeah. Now um That's what we want. I am uh so like <laughs> I said, as as established, as it says on the tin, I'm Cody Pondsmith. Um, I am the lead designer on the uh, Witcher TRPG. I lent a small hand on Cyberpunk Red, and I am the general manager of Artelsorian, so I, uh, I sort of handle the general scheduling and making sure that everything gets done relatively on time. Uh -huh. um, in a lot of cases, I'm sort of uh, the one who runs, runs meetings in the morning and makes sure everybody knows where everybody else is. And then... Uh -huh. uh, in my in my spare time, I spend a lot of time uh, going over going over Witcher material and uh, rallying stuff together to uh, to work on that uh, to work on that line. And for those people that don't know, can I ask? Well, I'm kind of curious here too because I don't know the exact I don't know exactly how long it's been, but how long have you worked at Art Talsorian? So I. Uh... The fun fact of this is, mm. visibly, I I have been um, oh boy, so I have been lead on the Witcher line since we first got you know the the rights to do the Witcher TRPG, mm -hmm. um, which I shudder to think is probably like eight eight years ago I think now something like that, um, 
and I have actually been working at Telstorian uh, functionally as long as I was legally able to work. I was going to – this is what I'm getting at. This is exactly no, I, what I'm uh, getting at. I literally started out in the mailroom at our Telsorian. Did you really? Yes. When we were getting the company started back up in in um, sort of the uh, the late 2000s, I think. I, I'm extremely mm-hmm. bad at times. Um, we had we had basically our site online, and we had back stock of books, and we had everything down in our our like basement, effectively in our in our house. And as soon as I was able to, as soon as I was legally able to work, I was right. down packing orders to send off to people across the globe. And uh, eventually, I, I worked my way up the ladder, literally from the mailroom to uh, to general manager. It's, it's like actually a, a, it's like a Charles ahead. Dickens novel. Ah. you started you started working technically and legally at a certain age yes. but before that you were putting your little hand in the in the machines and like sometimes getting it caught and and then the other members would be like don't, don't tell osha about that my uh my parents like to tell a story of when i was a toddler um w- w- back in california they would set up a uh, they'd set up a little bullpen of of boxes in the office that i could run around oh. and i would deliver like pens to people in the office and stuff oh they were training you, know, course, you. Yeah, because I was like, you know, knee high or whatever. Um, no, it's yeah. I basically, basically, as long as I could work, I've been working at Telstory, and I, I had some time where I was working other places while we were sort of like, um, while there wasn't as much stuff that needed to happen on my end, you know, back in shipping and when we were first doing Witcher stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, it. I have a. I have a horrible story that I've probably told a thousand times about how I wound up on the Witcher line, but uh, we'll get to your horrible stories soon enough, Cody. Excellent. Soon enough. Um, well, I was I was kind of wondering though. So then that that was what I was trying to sort of lead into here, and that was that yeah. you basically grew up with RPGs, like I, I'm assuming RPGs, like kind of in your blood, basically, because I mean your your family it's it's from what i understand it's a family business um yeah. is that like how did that uh how did that how did that affect your childhood what kind of a childhood did actually you have? the really interesting the really interesting part about that is that um you know i wasn't exactly like it's not like i was raised exactly to love trpgs i actually mm-hmm. wound up when i was really young i stumbled across some of our some of our games oh. and and pestered my uh and pestered my my dad into running them um i i grew up sort of like doing like real like literally like little kid play pretend kind of kind of trpgs right right um i like i ran my parents in a pokemon game when I was like, uh, oh God, I don't remember how old I was, but I was little. I was real little, um, and I just sort of—it's weird because I, I, the best way that I can describe it is this: that just I, I grew up immersed in it, mm-hmm. and you know, it was always just sort of part of life to a certain extent. You know, eventually, my my dad. You know, would run weekly games for me and my friends, yeah, and you know stuff like that. It just sort of grew to become a big part of my life, and it's been kind of interesting professionally because I, it was this interesting introduction to role playing and game design where I didn't so much like set out to learn game design as I sort of picked up certain types of game design almost instinctually yeah. by just being involved in it as it were or around it are, are you okay cody is there is there a dog attacking you now or is there small... uh, there is not i i oh. forgot to plug in my computer so I, I i will just one moment that's amazing you forgot to plug in your computer and yet we're doing an interview or perhaps you just mean the power supply there we go oh okay great no, it's running on the power of my sheer willpower, but uh, <laughs> that's right. The force of your goodwill is powering this interview. Yes. Um, so let me ask you then. So, I it sounds like you've made a free choice and you've chosen role playing games, despite the fact. Like I grew up in a family where my my father was like an aircraft mechanic, and so like I was always around like aircraft and 
uh, and I mean, as much as I loved it, I kind of felt the need to sort of get away from like, you know, aircraft design or manufacturing and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Did you feel, so I guess you said that you stumbled upon it. So it sounds like you fell into it yourself. Um, did you just sort of gravitate towards it naturally and it would just came that way to you or did you have to make I, a choice at a certain point? It did. It, it kind of just, it kind of just came to me. I think part of it is I've always been, uh, I've always been a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I love telling stories. Like I said, a lot of my childhood was, was playing pretend with my friends and, you know, yeah. stuff like that. And, <laughs> Uh, the other side of that is that I am I'm just whimsical enough to play pretend, but not whimsical enough to not want to have some amount of format. So I I would wound up, I would wind up you know kind of evolving out, out out of sort of just like the straight up like playing pretend to like actually wanting some like structure. Right. And that just kind of evolved to role playing because that's sort of the end point of that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I just that was just something that just sort of evolved over time. I I never really made a big like decision to to be a game designer. You know, when I was much younger, there were other things I wanted to do. Like for a while, I wanted to be a marine biologist, and you know, for a while, I wanted to do like prop design and set design for mm. movie and TV. Mm. but I just sort of wound up as a game designer because it's what I would do normally, you know? I think what's what's funny is that, what well, can I ask, what are the things about marine biology and set designing or prop building that, like, appeal to you? Like, I'm trying to sort of figure out how they're connected, it, if they are at all. I mean, so the marine biology was just that I was a big, and still kind of am, mm. I... I, I, there's a fascination for me to uh, undersea life uh, just because in a way it is so different from everything we, we, you know, experience. I am absolutely terrified of deep ocean, but at the hmm. same time fascinated by it because it is so much this like, you know, people talk about, you know, it being like this other world, but it yeah. so much feels like that. You know, especially since we have, you know, theoretically explored so little of it. You know, there's this really sort of, to me, sort of magical disconnect between the world above water and the world below water. Um, so that was sort of a, that was like the big push on that was just that I found almost everything about it fascinating. Um, <clears throat> and on the prop and set design, it was just that I... Like in a way, I I I was not the I was not the sibling to get the artistic talent. My sister is a much better artist than I am, but I love the concept of uh, I love the concept of sort of making something out of nothing, mm -hmm. the sort of making something new with standard things. It's another reason I, for for a while I also wanted to be a professional chef. Um, is just this concept of taking very base materials and making something cool or beautiful or you know I you know amazing out of it yeah i well i kind of see that oh i'm sorry no go ahead go ahead well i was just going to say like in a way you're sort of composing things right so with the yeah. marine biology idea like it it reminds me a lot of maybe world building say from a yeah. role-playing standpoint except instead of actually building these things you're going out finding them and defining them in order to lend structure to like what you see and maybe yeah. the, the prop building is almost the other end of that where someone maybe gives you a template and says here's what the scene looks like or here's what we're going to do. We need a device or we need something that will do this, that, or the other thing. And then you have to sort of reverse engineer from what you have in your screenplay or what you have in your your idea to create something. And you're, you're right though, it's really weird the way that when you think about, I, I wasn't thinking that the interview would go here, but now that I'm seeing this, like I can see like on the Venn diagram where those things might all kind of, or in the same yeah. as being a chef, I mean, you're composing a recipe, putting it together step by step and then presenting it to someone else for their enjoyment. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating really looking back on it. Do you think, um, 
would would you say then that those are some of your bigger influences like were you also like looking at like sea life when you were a little kid um and that now maybe informs a lot of what you're doing in the design world or were you thinking about building props cool things like to add to say you know one of your rpgs um what do you think has influenced you in that respect for your work now i think it's i think that definitely factors in i you know because uh at the foundation of at the foundation of you know my sort of design and my interaction with with trpgs is that i love i'm an absolute sucker for world building yeah i i i love building worlds and then fleshing out those worlds mm. um and to that end you know that that was a big uh, influence on the prop design was that i could then you know use that knowledge to also build out like props for the worlds i was running in um, so a lot of, a lot of my influence in design is just this concept of taking, sort of taking from everywhere and fitting it all into, fitting all these cool ideas into one, you know, concise, relatively, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah, concise package. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. this one world that makes sense and has all these cool things that you can explore and see and whatnot. And to that end, I, I'm actually influenced by a lot of things because I'm constantly like, uh, you know, I do a lot of hiking out into various areas of the wilderness around Washington. I watch a lot of like videos on YouTube of uh, documentaries and various like time periods and you know, all this stuff that I'm kind of constantly like getting ideas and inspiration mm. to like put into one, not one, but like put into various like worlds and concepts and things like that. Is there anything in particular, and it's okay if not, but is there anything you can think of offhand, maybe that from outside of RPGs and maybe your marine biology or prop making that has kind of made it into any of the works that you've worked on, like anything where you've seen something and just said, aha, I'm just going to put that in the game. Um, weirdly, the current, like, uh, one that I very much got at the moment is, um, I, I'm running a game, the Monster of the Week game that I'm, that I'm running, I run every Monday, um, is heavily, 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 heavily influenced by, um, various, like, I, I found a I found a, a a fascination with scary stories on YouTube stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, urban legends and you know uh, various like sort of fantastical scary story stuff um, so I draw a lot on those because I think to some extent it it creates this it helps build into this like mystery that I that I'm currently running my players through um, but I take a lot of inspiration from from those stories on YouTube um, and kind of put that into what I'm running at the moment so it's because a lot of times when I get on something that inspires me I'll like tend to focus on that a lot right you know right I'll spend most of my time you know listening to scary stories on YouTube or like looking up you know whatnot is it is it safe to say then because it does sound like you're, a, I mean, obviously to be a designer, I would imagine most designers are really world builders. But I, I would say that there's a distinction, though, between sort of the world building that you do as a game master uh, versus the world building that you do as a designer. Um, so is it kind of safe to say that you're, would you call yourself more of a game master than a player? I am absolutely more of a game master than a player. And I think probably that comes from the fact that I, I I am in that that dubious situation that I think a lot of people are of I'm I for a long time was kind of the best or the only person confident in running games in my group so I became the de facto game master yeah um I I joke with people to some extent that I'm a I'm a terrible player because I get so many ideas and I'm influenced by so many things and what transfers really well to being a good game master does not transfer to being a good player you know my, my problem in games when i'm a player is 
I'll come up with a really great character concept and I'll give it to my GM and I'll be like, okay, this is my character. This is what I'm going to be playing in your game. And then like three days later, I'll have another great character concept. And if I'm a GM, then I just file that away and I go, yeah. you know, okay, this is an NPC that you'll, sh you'll see, you know, later. Yeah. And I'll, you know, I can use everything that I think of, but when I'm a player, I always run into this situation of like, uh, but I just had this new idea and yeah. it's really cool, you yeah. know. It's it's really interesting that you, you say that because it's not something I'd ever consciously or, wait, subconsciously, whatever the term is, really focused and thought about. But yeah, you're right. I mean, when you're a game master, if you come up with something new, I mean, it has to go through a certain, I, I for me, it has to go through a certain filter, right? Because I, yeah. I need a certain sort of character for a certain sort of setting at a certain time. But when you're a player, you're actually quite limited in a way because you need to focus on your one character for however many sessions you're going to be playing. Um, yeah. How does that how does that inform say your approach then? So let me let me switch things around here and say yeah. let's say you're not a game master and you're a player. How do you approach? Um, playing in a in a when I say long running I mean 10 15 20 session uh, uh, campaign is there something is something going through your mind that's different in the creation of your character than would be going through your mind when you're creating worlds or creating NPCs it's it's really in that situation it's more a balance of detail if I if I know I'm gonna be in a long running campaign and I'm not going to be changing characters then I really try to like, I try to work out really deep who that character is and like where they're going so that I have a concept of sort of where that will go as the game progresses. I do a lot of like, I get character pictures for like all of, all of the like gear my character has. Like this is what my, my character's sword looks like or what have you. And then I sort of try to plan ahead a little bit for like, this is what my character's goal is going to be. And this is sort of how they can achieve it. So that even if I'm playing the same character for a long period of time, I kind of have a knowledge of like, I get really invested in that character as much as possible. And then I know where that character is going to kind of go, assuming that nothing wild happens. Because I've had characters where like, I do that, and then the GM throws like a a, a plot hook or a, a twist or something, and that kind of branches me off onto a different concept. But at that point, that's fine. You know, then I have something else to work out with the character. But I am always, I am always a big fan of character development in games. Mm. I, I I would consider it a failure if a character that I start playing at session zero is roughly the same character 20 sessions later you know right i i'm a big fan of some actual change in the character over the course of the game whether that's you know how they interact with the world or even like physically what they're like how about um okay so i i switch things now i'm gonna switch them back okay so, so get ready um, yeah. So with that in mind, here's here's one of the things that I often like kind of hear about. Um, how do you see your role as a game master um, for, say, we've got a let's say we've got a seasoned player that kind of comes at it and they sort of know, all right, this is how I build my character. I'm looking for an arc if that's what they're looking for in the story. Um, yeah. I'm looking for this, this and that. Now, you also have, on the other hand, a, a, a player that comes in and maybe doesn't know what they're doing maybe they're brand new to rpgs in general how do you handle a, a a player like that what what do you do to help or enable them to to sort of play so in general the way i i i have this sort of sort of ethos or whatever mm -hmm. whereby you know uh the way i see it if if the people at the table aren't having fun i'm not running a good game so a lot of my game design, not game design, but a lot of my, you know, how I put together games as a GM is that I'm trying to set up a game that everybody will have fun and everybody feels like they got to do something cool or have a very exciting adventure or something of the like. So 
you know, in a lot of cases, it's one of those where I can trust the very and to sort of you know i can give them some basic plot hooks and mm -hmm. they'll kind of follow it out and i love those players to a certain extent because i can riff off of them very easily you know if i give them a plot hook i know they're going to probably follow it right. and you know i can create something around what they're doing but for the players that don't have that as much i like to kind of whether that is working with them or sort of doing it as the game progresses, I like to give them their own sort of subplot that if I know the player, I like to get to know my players as much as possible. Mm -hmm. If I know the player, I'll try to customize it to like what I know they enjoy. Um, but I like to give them a subplot that I can kind of sort of nudge them along a little. Yeah, yeah. Like, here's the thing, you don't have to fight you don't have to fight with the seasoned player for screen time as much. You don't have to fight to do something cool. Here's a cool thing that's devoted to your character. And, you know, I give you very, very obvious options of how to follow it out. You know, it's not fully like, you know, do you pick option A or do you pick option B? But, you know, I make it pretty easy to get along with for people who aren't super familiar with role playing so that they have what is to some extent sort of a curated adventure, yeah. but it's a curated adventure that if they do something super wild, I always try to kind of, you know, go with that. I try not to, even if I'm giving them that curated adventure, I try to be flexible with what they want to do in the course of that adventure to make sure I don't railroad them. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, I think that's actually, a really good point and and that's an important point actually too like i i like the fact that what it sounds like you're doing is you're really enabling and encouraging them to sort of find find their footing in a way and you're guiding and probably bringing them along in the adventure and then maybe moving them to that point where they're far more seasoned and maybe can take more of an independent kind of role in in creation and and in in the story itself um I like that. Um, how does that vary then between? So of course we we're talking about GMing now, and we're talking about playing. But now on the other side, the the next side is like you get an assignment for a new game. You've got to come up with it from scratch, or you're working with a licensed property. But either way, you have to come up with something. What do you do to build that world, or or design that experience in a way that is you know, it leaves an impression and yet leaves enough wiggle room and space for for game masters like yourself out there to come along and, and play with that world and maybe change it around. Is there any particular approach you have or philosophy maybe? My my philosophy and that sort of thing is that I, I, I kind of have always believed that at the core of a, a, at the core of a, at the core of a tabletop game, mm -hmm. the system is what gives you the feel because if you have a really good dm they can basically make anything work a, a good dm a really good dm can run you know anything and make it fun um but at a more standard level having a system that reflects the experience you want to have means everybody can have that experience hmm. so what I try to do a lot of times, and I did this with, with Witcher when we when we did the Witcher TRPG, you know, there were some limitations on Witcher TRPG because, you know, by contract we were supposed to use certain aspects of right. the system from 2020. But, you know, I spent a lot of time going over, you know, uh, aspects of the Witcher books and the, the Witcher video games just trying to determine, like, how should this feel and if i once i know how it should feel how do i write the rules so that it feels like that yeah you know how do i how do i create a set of rules how do i create a magic system that will at the table feel like how magic feels in witcher um and that is in some respects extremely difficult i was gonna say <laughs> Please tell us how difficult it is. Please. Well, the 
because I came into, you know, one of the things that I, I give a lot of credit to um, Mr. Hutt, my, uh, my co-designer on the most recent Witcher book that we're working on, is that we came to role-playing and we came to, well, we didn't come to role-playing. We came to game design in very different ways. Hmm. And he came to it in a, in, to some extent, a much more measured way. So I, I've learned a lot from him in the course of sort of using the math specifically to get that feel. Because originally, you know, when I was doing Witcher TRPG, it was entirely feel. You yeah. know, it was entirely like I, I put in a number and I test with that number and it doesn't really feel exactly right. So I'll, I'll move that number up one and then I'll test again and I'll see how it feels and now it feels okay. So a lot of that was just, you know, sort of by guess and by gosh, like I knew a certain amount of how things had to work instinctively, but a lot of that was just like, feels like it should be here. Yeah. Tested. Maybe we need to put it here. Maybe here. Okay, there. So it, it was this very interesting dance of trying to basically trying to feel it out, which was not always easy, but it was an interesting experience because you'd get a lot of sort of back and forth on like, well, this, like, um, we have a system of critical injuries in the Witcher TRPG, which are based on uh, your skill level because, or to some extent skill level, because what I wanted to establish was Witcher is a very visceral world. Hmm. Um, you know, when Geralt of Rivia, the main character of the books, kills somebody in the books, it is because he did a very specific thing. Yeah. You know, it is because yeah. he cut one of their arteries that caused them to bleed out. Right. Or, you know, he did something right. specific. Because Geralt of Rivia is a very, very skilled swordsman. So I, what I wanted to say was, okay, we have a visceral system where combat has to feel very deadly and very gory to some extent because that's how it feels so i want that but i want how you get those wounds to feel right so originally that was concussive damage because you know a lot of the concussive damage from a blow goes through the armor and i was going to go like okay so even if you don't deal damage through the armor you have a certain amount of like concussive force that still goes through because even if the blade doesn't cut them, if it's a big heavy blade, it'll still like, you know, rock them or whatever. But I moved away from that to skill base. So now it was, if you roll higher than your opponent's defense, you get a critical wound at certain levels because what I wanted to reflect was I am a great swordsman mm -hmm. fighting someone who's not a great swordsman. So I should naturally be scoring more more dangerous wounds on them because I am more skilled than them. Or in some cases, because I got very lucky and the dice happened to roll very high. Um, so there was this fascinating situation of sort of feeling out how that had to feel and then making the system fit how that had to feel. Right. And then the other side of that was once I had that critical injury system, I had this horrible situation at one point on a table where I in in the final game you have an option you have an option called stabilization mm -hmm. where if you if your you know friend has had their hand chopped off or something and they're bleeding out of the stump that used mm -hmm. to be their hand yeah. you have the option to tourniquet the hand and initially I only had surgery so if you were not a surgeon you could not treat that wound right and I had a terrible moment at a table when I was playtesting it where they fought this horde of like little Leoneckers, which are these little goblin creatures. And one of them got a really lucky score on one of the players and collapsed their, their lung. And I didn't have a system of stabilization. Right. So this player was there suffocating on the ground because they, they had this collapsed lung and none of the rest of the player were doctors. Yeah. So they were like, can we get him back to town? And I was like, no, he's suffocating. He's going <laughs> to suffocate in the next right. like seven rounds or whatever. So they just had to sit there and like watch this watch character die. Yeah. So 
at that point, I was like, okay, that doesn't feel right. We need some way to deal with that without right. necessarily having a doctor. So it's this weird dance, or it was this weird dance of kind of like feeling for the right balance. And how did you sit down? And how long did the creation process for Witcher, which is, of course, a licensed property, take you? And um, like... Were you under like certain deadlines to get out at a certain time? And and um, one third final question to that: Did you say that you had built Witcher on top of some of the mechanics for twenty for Cyberpunk twenty twenty, or were you saying, or did I misunderstand so, that? So uh, so okay. So the way Witcher worked was that basically um, CDPR wanted us to do a Witcher TRPG, and they wanted the core foundation to be based on Cyberpunk. Okay. Um, so what I wound up doing was I basically took Cyberpunk and I figured out how to adapt that to Witcher. Of course, that is the shorthand because what I kind of came out to was, you know, Witcher is a dark fantasy setting with magic where yeah. people primarily fight with swords. And Cyberpunk is a dark future setting without magic where people primarily fight with guns. Right. So while the foundation of Witcher is Cyberpunk, so much of that system had to change right. because it, I was it say. needed to fit something that yeah. was entirely different. Yeah. You know, I added a magic system. I added the critical injury system. I added, I, I custom tinkered with the melee system so that it reflected the Witcher video games more closely. Yeah. That um, was going to be a question too, is how closely did you feel you had to sort of, because it feels like you're trying to meet a lot of different things here. You know, you've got the books, You've got the video games that that you know they're probably going to be your primary audience at least to start with, like your base. Yeah. And then from there, though, you want to do your own thing, or you want to do it in a true way that makes it feel like you're adapting. First, first and foremost, we really wanted to make sure that this was so that the Witcher franchise has had a problem, which I I think it still kind of has, but mm -hmm. it really had it when we were doing the Witcher TRPG, which is that. It is an incredibly fractured franchise. You know, you have fans of the books, you have fans of the video games, you have fans of the comics, you now have fans of the TV show. And when we were writing the TRPG, there wasn't, I'm not going to say there wasn't a whole lot of love be between those sort of factions, yeah. but there was a definite sort of, sort of faction war in certain places between right. those, those factions. So we wanted to do as much as possible was create the Witcher TRPG such that it would be a bridge between the yeah. two biggest yeah. factions in that franchise, which were the books and the video games. We wanted to basically say, if you came from the books, then, you know, we have done our best to respect everything that happened in the books and also bring in the video games. If you came from the video games, we have done our best to respect everything came from the video right. games, but also explain everything that happened in the books so that you you understand the background um and lisa and i uh worked really 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 hard to to mesh those together while still trying to kind of create a, a trpg that felt right and that process was absolutely grueling um I was going to say, it, though, I think it paid off. I mean, it the, definitely... the, the game was well-received, and just from my own personal standpoint, like, I I think it feels great. Like, I, I enjoy the game, and I think you've done a great job. And I, you know, I wanted... One of the reasons I kind of wanted to talk about this licensed property versus, say, Cyberpunk, which is an original property, is so many times, we all know this, a licensed property game whether it be video or tabletop or whatever comes out and and nobody likes it but a lot of people buy it anyway but i think in this case this is one of the rare um exceptions where i i think the game itself it lives up to you know the the name and and it does i think to your credit you did do a very good job i haven't read all the books but from the books that i have read I think you did do a very good job with with the you know marrying the look and feel with not just the, a look and feel within like say the writing of the book but actually the mechanics 
reflecting it. And it kind of tells me, I can tell because you had mentioned, oh, well, you know, it may say this on the table, but when I rolled to get it, it didn't feel like it. So I fe- I can tell how you're trying to marry those two. So yeah. In, it it paid off, but to to answer your to answer your uh, your first question second, it yeah. paid off, but that was that was effectively six years of blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah, you know that that was a ridiculous amount of work put into that between effectively me and Lisa. Um, I wonder sometimes how many people fully grasp that the the Witcher TRPG was basically put together by two people. Um, well. Looking at it, I, that's the first thing I noticed because um, I do look at credits pages and, and yeah. like when I'm not just saying when I do an interview, but I look at it when I do do you know just play the game. Yeah. And your two names, I mean, you're on layout and design. <laughs> yeah. Like your writer, your layout and design, and I can't remember there was one other one. I can remember where they were on the page, but there was one other one. I was like, what? How? Like it feels like you were. And then there were six million artists. Yes, it looks like. And all and, of those, all of those were was art that we were, we were so fortunate to get all of that art because by the time we were finishing the Witcher TRPG, uh, CDPR was just starting to do their Gwent expansions for mm-hmm. for their for the Witcher spinoff. So we had so much beautiful art to use that they they you know they insisted yeah. that we use their art. Well, speaking of beautiful art. Here's my, yes. that's my super professional segue. Um, Cyberpunk Red is gorgeous as well. They're both yes, really good is. looking books. They're different looking books. They each sort of have their own kind of fingerprint. Um, but Cyberpunk Red looks really nice. And when I say looks really nice, I don't mean just the artwork. As a teacher, when I look at a game, I'm looking for ease of um, ease of use as, as a game master. And my gold standard is, is is um our teachers teachers manuals for for uh regular textbooks and Uh what i immediately notice about it is i don't know exactly what they're called in the professional world but you have a lot of call outs on the sides that help you flip around and move really quickly um between between pages um what is the experience of working on cyberpunk red been for you as far as um you know uh, what you've done on it and 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 maybe the differences between the licensed property and the original property so i i i was i, I was i did a lot more work on red when we were doing the jumpstart kit mm-hmm. um i was very heavily involved in that with james um working out sort of the the foundation of what would eventually go on to be uh the the core book James, James and Mike did the, the majority of the design on the core book, moving forward the stuff we did in the Jumpstart kit. Um, I would kind of pop in from time to time and sort of poke at stuff, but very much more you know minorly. Mm-hmm. But a lot of my interaction with Red was actually at that readability level. Mm-hmm. A, lot of, a lot of my interaction with Red was basically at the level where we were starting to get in text or we would get in system. Right. And I would, you know, read through sections of it and, you know, determine whether it was accurate to what we had previously set up, um, you know, how, how well it read. I put it through the editors and whatnot like that. And that was sort of more my interaction with it, which was interesting because, you know, um, it was very much, I, it was almost like being able to look at it sort of from the outside mm-hmm. and sort of then give commentary based on that sort of outside view. Um, you know, I, I attended a lot of meetings with James and Mike of like going over very specific aspects of the, of the book where, you know, I'd put in my two cents here or there, but a lot of it was just like watching them sort of work through it as it were. Um, so it was very interesting to kind of see that from the outside. And then when we got to like the final sort of final days of the book, as it were, when we were doing um, the layout, you know, Jay, Jay Gray is our, our layout master for the Witcher, for not Witcher, for, um, for, for Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk Red, yeah. And one of the things that he really, really wanted to do was make it just as readable as possible. Yeah. Just 
just make it so that nobody would get confused or lost or, you know, have a hard time working their way through the book. Because there's a lot of aspects of that book that you could get lost in if right. it didn't have, you know, guides. So, you know, I got to a few times kind of read through the book and like kind of figure out how it was going to read and, you know, give my two cents here or there. And I've been tremendously impressed by Jay's work on this because it really is it really is amazingly readable. And I'm always kind of amazed because, you know, like I said, I, at the earliest stages of this book, we had a lot of, dis we had a lot of like discussions mm -hmm. about how it was going to flow because, you know, there are aspects of that, like the multiple types of character creation and the yeah. night market chapter that we went back and forth a lot on like, where does this happen in the book and how are we going to lay this out? And, you know, there was sort of a lot of back and forth on on how that was going to be put together that came out really well i think in in great part due to a lot of the the sort of additional pieces that that jay put in there yeah i i like um for, again i'm this is from a teaching perspective and i guess from obviously a gming perspective but what I like is the flow of the book. And I might be getting a little too obscure with my kind of references here because I'm talking about teaching now. But what is important to me when I pick up a game or when I'm going to try to help a friend of mine get a friend of mine like into game mastering, because we know we all know we need more GMs out there. Yes. Um, what what I like about this is that it starts off with a piece of fiction which is basically kind of immersing you in the world and probably gives you a little bit of a, and I'm talking about the, the hardcover book. Um, yeah, yeah. Or not the hardcover because that's not out yet, but the PDF. Um, yeah. It starts off with the fiction, which sort of immerses you in that world and gives you some of the big bullet points of, of maybe some changes for those people that have played prior iterations of the game, but also like, just brings the new person in because the cyberpunk genre can be kind of over well just almost by definition cyberpunk is supposed to be overwhelming and yeah. then following that you go into some really nice call outs on you know uh basically a, a quick tutorial on what rpgs are um and then you go into like character creation and um you introduce things in a way that's very um I mean, I, I know it's probably also built for the PDF market, but yeah. I can see someone with a hard copy of the book can easily flip between those pages. And, and I think yeah. it's, it's really well laid out. I'm really glad. We, we spent a lot of time um, and a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of sleepless nights making sure that it was, it was the best it could be. Well, it's, it's got a huge, like, I mean, myself, like I said, the first time I picked up Cyberpunk, uh, I was 14 or 15 maybe. And my, like my father had dropped me off at the game shop war. I'm just going to give a shout out to a game shop that's no longer open, but it was called war and pieces in West Hartford. And I remember just like picking it up and, um, you know, the artwork these days reflects that time. And, and I thought in, in that respect, it's a very beautiful representation of what a, what a cyberpunk game looked like then. Um, yeah. And and now even today, you've you've built up such a, a following with the game itself. I mean, expectations would be really high, and I would imagine that s stress levels at Artelsorian yeah. might yeah. be equally high <laughs> as you. Well, it's especially it was especially you know that way. Uh, you know, I can only speak for myself, but you know, we red is. Red was always kind of this, like, it was the return because, mm -hmm. you know, um, we had had 2020 and we have a tremendous and, and beautiful following for 2020. And, you know, we had done uh, V3 3.0, which was, I still maintain, is a great game, but not necessarily what we needed Cyberpunk to be at that point. Yeah. Um, and so there was this kind of understanding in the back of my mind of like, Oh man, this is, this is kind of it. Yeah. Like this, this, this has got to go well. You know, we're trying to create something that people who played 2020 
are going to love and yeah. people who played 2013 are going to love. Uh, but we're also trying to create something that, you know, isn't going to be completely alienating to yeah. people who may not have played it. Yeah. And on the, the other hand, we've got this entirely, this entirely different sort of consideration, which is that we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be coming to this from 2077. Yeah. And, you know, everybody who got uh, everybody who got a digital copy or I think a physical as well copy of, of 2077 got a PDF copy of 2020. Right, right. So we've now got all these people who not only do they probably not really know 2020, but they also probably have never played a role playing game. Yeah, yeah. So we've got to also create something that kind of is beginner level enough or has enough explanation that they can get into it and enjoy it as well. I I think I I really think that you've done a good job. I mean, I my only thing is I'm more of a print and ink yeah. kind of guy. Like so for me, it's it's a little bit tougher with the PDF, so I'm I'm definitely yeah. I've got the PDF. I don't have the the hard copy. Um we are we are getting a second printing as fast as we can. Cool. No, that's that's awesome. Um I'll be definitely one of your first guys to, to grab that. Um, but I just, uh, you know, I think it's a real accomplishment. I think it was a real smart thing that you did to go with 2045 for the print game and then 2077 so that those people that are into it can go back and look at, like, some of the development. Um, yeah. And and I really enjoy that that aspect of it. Like, there's this real sense, like, I think mike said in i th I think it I, it was either in an interview i read or it was in maybe the game itself where he was talking about how he builds in eras maybe every yeah. 10 or 20 years i think it is um and you can see that reflected in in the game itself um so can you can you tell me like is there what do you think it what is it about the genre of cyberpunk that is so attractive to so many people and what is it about your particular flavor, cyberpunk red in this iteration, that's that's grabbed so many people? I think the biggest thing, I think the biggest thing about cyberpunk as a genre, and this maybe says more for us than than others, but it is that while it is always sort of grim, and you know, in most cases, the 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 deck is stacked against you. There is a weird sort of freedom to to the cyberpunk genre that is that is kind of always there mm -hmm. this sort of understanding that you know sort of everything is out to get you but and this is something we try to carry forward in red a lot everything is sort of out to get you but as long as you're as long as you're you know quick with a gun and you're quick-witted you can sort of have anything it's it's this amazing sort of freedom of you can live you can sort of live the life you want to live as long as you're tough enough or smart enough to make your way in a world that's trying to destroy you sort right. of right right so while while it, it does kind of the world is designed to sort of beat you down there is this sort of hope and freedom to the setting that i think really appeals to people yeah, I think it's it's an interesting genre filled with all kinds of like contradictions, you know, because what's weird is personally for myself, I remember this is so ridiculous, but I remember as like a as like a 7th or 8th grade kid doing projects where you had to like do these projects where you talk about what you think a utopia would be and how you think the world would look really beautiful and i remember everyone coming in with like these cutouts from magazines of like sunshine and beautiful fields and i came in with like shots from blade runner and <laughs> um and my english teacher who i have since of course followed in in careers um <laughs> just kind of looked at me funny and i tried to explain like the beauty of it and and i think even i couldn't understand because um you know, there's there's such it seems like on on one level, there's such violence, but there's also like there, to me, there's some hope there in yeah. that there's freedom to do what you want to do, 
I guess. Well, it's like one of my one of my one of my more recent cyberpunk characters who actually wound up being a key character in Red. Um, it was this guy named Hornet, or his his tag, his alias was Hornet, mm-hmm. and the the entire character was basically this this guy who lived in Night City, um, who worked as a fixer and primarily did you know false IDs for people and you know falsified documentation and eventually wound up getting into you know uh, selling selling street drugs and stuff like that and the character the the clincher the, the the key of this character was that they had been left a house in a reasonably nice suburban neighborhood on oh, the like outskirts it. of night city and it was this really nice sort of suburban house that like they had grown up in with their family before their family was in prison um and other than having a meth lab in the basement they kept this house really really nice and they like had some amount of banter with their neighbors and stuff like that and so much of this character's life as a cyberpunk as an edge runner mm-hmm. was in service of sort of maintaining this this house that had sort of been part of their childhood and part of their life um and that was sort of the the duality of that character was like spending their days on the streets of night city eventually like developing horrible biotoxins and chemical warfare weapons to sell to corporations but then returning to this like almost white picket fence type house yeah that they had like family photos of their family in like a foot locker in their basement that they would like look at at the end of days and stuff like that so there's this sort of duality of this character who was doing all of this, but because it allowed them to have this this life that they wanted to have. Right. I think that's a really interesting thing, though. I mean, because it's it's not the mustache twirling villain or yeah. or like the starry eyed kind of hero that you usually see. And I think in that respect, I mean, we were sort of talking a little bit about this before before we went on air, but um, I think it it allows you to kind of examine not just maybe yourself but the motivations and ideas of other people maybe through role playing and thinking these things through i actually think as a as a game master i'd love that a, a character like that playing in in one of my games um well cody our our hour is up i i uh, i very much appreciate you coming on to to talk with us thank you so much um it, it, is there anything you'd like to, anything you'd like to leave us with before we, before we, shuffle off into the darkness, you going back uh, to work, me going to eat dinner. I think I think what I think the last thing I'd like to say is twofold. The first thing is, um, especially in in exciting times such as these, mm. make sure you can you can get an opportunity to get out and 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 hang out with your friends and play some TRPGs. If you're thinking about if you're if you're on the fence and you're thinking about getting into into role playing, there's a lot of really great online sources that you can find to to get mm-hmm. into it, and there's a lot of great online games going on. It's a lot of fun and it'll help you kind of keep yourself sane, as it were. And if you're out there thinking about becoming a game designer, you've got a game in your heart that you really want to get out onto paper, just do it. The only way to be a game designer is to start designing games. Excellent. And eventually you'll get good at it. <laughs> yeah, eventually. Someday. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Like, it's, I don't know about you, but I'm formed more from the mistakes I've made than my successes. So I yep. completely agree. Um, well, Cody, uh, thank you again uh, very much uh, to all of you, the viewers out there that are watching. Thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, we will be back. Uh, with another episode and another uh, role player uh, here in in the future. Um, And to each all of you, um, I know 2020 has been rough, but uh, I'm I'm stoked about 2021. I I hope we, you know, we can, you know, everybody has a happy, safe um, and productive 2021. And Cody, good luck to you and everybody else at our Telsorian with with all your games and your future projects. Thank you very much. And luck to you as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me.